Welcome to this breakout session where Dr. Steve Ball will pre be presenting on cultural partnerships, specifically engaging schools with artists and arts organizations. Dr. Steve is director of Birmingham Art School. He trained as a teacher, he worked as an actor and was the founding artistic director of the Playhouse. He was head of the arts for Birmingham City Council and associate director of the Birmingham Repertory Theatre for 17 years and is now co-chair of the Drama and Theatre Education Alliance. Over to you, Dr. Steve. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Ball. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this conference. I have very happy memories of South Africa, having holidayed there many times and most recently visited for the Asitesh Theatre for Young Audiences Conference in Cape Town, the Cradle of Creativity Conference, which was an amazing event in Cape Town. So I'm director of Birmingham Art School. Birmingham Art School isn't a school with children and young people, but it's an initiative that connects schools with arts organisations across Birmingham. We're principally concerned with equity of provision, to make sure that as many children and young people as possible in the city can benefit from Birmingham's rich cultural offer. Birmingham's the second largest city in the UK. It's a post-industrial city. It's produced motor cars and still produces chocolate and is very famous for the Cadbury's chocolate that it produces. In this city, we have more canals than Venice. And in 2022, we are honored to host the Commonwealth Games, which was beamed across the world and showcased the city and athletic talent far and wide. Birmingham has also been in the news, though, for less attractive reasons. Our city council, not the city itself, but the city council is essentially bankrupt with debts of, our, of around £700 million and is about to embark on huge budget cuts, which will undoubtedly impact the cultural organisations in the city and schools and youth services across the city. So that's one of the challenges that we're currently facing. The youth service is really important because we're one of the youngest cities in Europe, with 40% of our population under the age of 25. Birmingham is also one of the first super diverse cities in the UK. Citizens from ethnic minorities make up more than half of the population, 51% in fact. We're home to people from 187 different nationalities. 31% of our population is of Asian and Asian British heritage, and 11% of our population is made up of black, black British, Caribbean or African heritage. Birmingham has an incredibly rich, diverse cultural offer, with flagship international organisations like Birmingham Royal Ballet, the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, the Birmingham Repertory Theatre and Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, through to smaller arts organisations from Stan's Cap Theatre to Sampad South Asian Arts Development Agency and scores of individual artists sharing their talent with schools across the city. I'm pleased to say that we're joined by three of the arts organisations I mentioned earlier. Bavik Palmer, who's Head of Education for Birmingham Repertory Theatre, Pearl Chesterman, who's Director of Learning engagement, access and participation at Birmingham Royal Ballet, and Tom Spurgeon, who's Director of Learning at the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. Bavik, you've got two jobs. You're Deputy Director of Birmingham Art School and half-time, you're Head of Education at the Birmingham Rep. Tell us about Birmingham Repertory Theatre. Birmingham Rep is one of the largest uh, theatres in the UK. We have a huge programme of work for young people in schools and a large youth theatre programme as well. Our work in schools is very much about partnerships where one of our practitioners are in a school once a week, every week for the academic year. We've got 15 partnerships across the UK and some go even further beyond, uh, further into the West Midlands. A lot of our schools often renew their contracts with us because of the concept of bespoke relationships. When we work with schools, we, we have a lead teacher, we speak to the lead teacher about what their needs are and how we can support their curriculum needs, but also the individual needs that their young people might have. And through this sort of collaboration, our practitioners create performances with young people, deliver lessons and workshops that support curriculum needs, and also give young people multiple opportunities to come back into our building, see the building and see how a producing theatre works, but also come and see our wonderful productions. 
So how often do your education officers work in these schools then? They're in schools once a week, every week for the entire academic year. We've got five practitioners who oversee 15 different schools. Um, some schools work with us on a after school drama provision basis where they have a practitioner who comes in solely for the purpose of creating a production with young people and having them perform in our summer youth theatre festival. The rest of our schools have our practitioners in throughout the academic year and often even going into summer school programmes in the holidays. So it sounds like if those practitioners are in schools for full day every week, you're building up long-term relationships with those schools? That's exactly why we do that. We know that um, often other organisations may provide one-off workshops, but for us we genuinely believe that a holistic approach to learning is the best method, and therefore by having partnerships it means every child in that school by the end of an academic year gets a chance to take part in drama lessons. We often find our practitioners walking through a school and feeling like celebrities because young people that they've worked with previously in the year will literally be shouting their names, trying to say hello, trying to ask, when are we going to get to work with you again? And it sounds like a lot of that work is outreach. Is, is some of it in reach? Do, do those young people get the opportunity to perform at the Birmingham Rep Theatre too? Absolutely. All of those young people who work with us through partnerships, through every type of partnership, gets the chance to come back to the theatre, take part in a backstage tour and have a Q&A with our staff. In addition to that, um, when they create performances, if they have after school clubs or they're going through summer school programs, they will create plays in a week or play over a, over a terms basis. And those performances will then be very much linked to our productions. We have a winter festival uh, where every single year the schools on our silver partnership get a chance to devise a production linked to our Christmas show. So in the past we've had Peter Pan, we've had, um, we've had The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Uh, young people create their own stories of what would happen if they went into the wardrobe, what characters would they meet, and they can add whatever they want into that mix. And then they bring that back into the building after weeks of rehearsing it and perform in a space where they get to have um, a proper technical rehearsal under the lights with sounds, with props, so it feels like a professional experience for them, even if they're as little as as, as six years old. Thanks, Bavik. Pearl, tell us a bit about Birmingham Royal Ballet. Thanks, Steve. Birmingham Royal Ballet is an international touring ballet company, so we are home in Birmingham, but we tour extensively across the UK and internationally, so in Europe and then uh, China, America. We've been to South Africa a very long time ago, but not recently. And you have a rather well-known artistic director? Yes, our artistic director is Carlos Costa, the Cuban dancer, who's particularly famous. I heard him speak very passionately a few months ago about Dance Track, a programme that BRB's been running for many years. Tell us a bit more about Dance Track. Yeah, Dance Track has been going now for 25 years, and it's our talent identification and training programme. So we go out into schools to work with the teachers to identify those children that have got potential for ballet. We're looking at their flexibility, their focus, all of those attributes they need for ballet. And then if they are successful through that programme, that process, we will invite them in and they are given free, working, free workshops with us for 12 months. They get opportunities to come into uh, see performances, they get free uniform, and they have the potential to be with us then for um, several years, up to five years, um, and then hopefully go on to vocational training where they train full time in ballet alongside their education work. And I remember seeing the Nutcracker production uh, at Birmingham Hippodrome by Birmingham Ballet a few months ago and one of the dance track students was performing professionally. Yes, we've had some great successes. But when the children get to the age of 9, 10, they have the opportunity to audition for Nutcracker. There's um, eight children in the Nutcracker and over the past few years we've had the ma majority of those have come from the Dance Track programme. But our big success also is um, Oscar Kempsey Fagg, who's one of our new dancers, and we identified him many years ago when he was seven in school in Birmingham, and he's gone through his training now and been offered that contract by Carlos to be part of our company, which is just amazing. Fantastic. And any other learning projects you're working on at the moment? We work on we work on lots, but Dance Track has, has 25 years. It's a big program, and we identify. Uh, we've got 113 in our first year cohort this year, but we see over two and a half thousand children every year. So that takes a big chunk of our time. 
We've also got a dance company called Free Fall Dance Company, which is for learning disabled young people who also show talent in dance. Um, and it helps them with their cognitive ability, they work together, their teamwork, their confidence, everything that goes with dancing and performing. Um, and that, again, is a long-standing programme, so they've just celebrated 21 years of free for dance company. Wow, fantastic. Thanks, Pearl. Hi, Tom, tell us about CBSO. Hi, Steve. Um, so CBSO stands for City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. We're an internationally touring ensemble Again, like Pearl said, for BRB at home in Birmingham, but perform across the UK and across the world as well. Um, we've got 90 amazing musicians on our staff and about 50 people working backstage. So in total, the organisation, there's about 140 creatives, artists, producers working to create incredible music experiences for audiences in Birmingham, but also with a huge learning and engagement programme for children, young people and communities as well. And I hear you've set up a school. Yeah, just casually. As you do. <laughs> in the school. Yeah, um, so we're working in partnership with a trust called Shireland Collegiate Academy Trust. Um, and we opened Shireland CBSO Academy in September. <coughs> and so that's a free state school open to anyone in Sandwell, um, which is a neighbouring local authority to Birmingham. As I said, it opened in September. We've taken 150 year seven students. Um, and as years go on, we'll bring new students in. Essentially, the, the main aim of the school is to ensure that everyone that comes through that school has opportunity to make, listen, and engage with music at the highest possible level. Um, so that there's a known and well-documented decline in music education across the UK at the moment. So this school, we've set it up, hopefully to prove that when you put music at the heart of a curriculum, that it improves um, children's attendance, it improves their test scores, but mainly it creates a love of music. So it's not necessarily a vocational music school, it's just that music is at the centre of it? Yeah, it's, it's a standard state school, they do all the same lessons that any other state school would in the UK, but we spent a good 18 months working with the Trust to design a curriculum that puts music at the heart of every single subject. So when they're doing maths, there are connections to music, when they're doing literature, they look at one module, for example, is about Sherlock Holmes and Arthur Conan Doyle, and they use that to then track onto Morse code, which then tracks into music and then tracks into stage notation. So we're trying to find links everywhere we can from one subject into music. And every child that goes gets free instrumental or vocal lessons, and that's in partnership with the local music hub who provide those. But we also have CBSO musicians and artists going in on average once a week to do masterclasses, demonstrations and Q&As. And what about other schools across the city and the region? How, how are they able to engage with the CBSO? Yes, there's quite a lot on offer actually. Um, there's standard things that they can book in in terms of getting a quartet of musicians to go and play at your school, which for most schools isn't a standard thing that you have world-class musicians playing there. Um, we have schools concerts every year from Key Stage 1 two and three, so from ages six up to uh, 14, um, that happen at Symphony Hall, and we get about 14,000 kids through for those concerts, and they, at the time of filming, are happening next week, so we're all quite intensely focused on those. And we also have quite a large programme for SEND students and those with profound and multiple learning difficulties, which is a really beautiful programme where essentially musicians are in every week during term time, building the relationships, and again doing what Pearl and Bab have mentioned of building not just a love of music, but all of the other skills that go alongside that in terms of teamwork, cooperation, and all of those things. Thanks, Tom. I'm about to tell our virtual delegates about Birmingham Art School, but can you tell us from a CBSO perspective about what you think the benefits of Birmingham Art School are to CBSO and the wider city? Yeah, of course. I mean it's made my job a lot easier, if it's okay to say that, because we spend lots of our time doing consultation and it's really difficult for us to get into the schools and connect with the right people to, to understand what they need. But essentially that's one of Birmingham Art School's purpose, as I understand it, is to connect schools with the arts um, organisations and educators in the city. So from our side, it means that we have really authentic connections with those schools and can 
change our work and produce work that's really relevant to those people. And essentially, someone else is doing that hard work for us. So it's incredibly useful. Well, thank you all. It's been great to hear about the opportunities that your organisations provide to children and young people across the city. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, Bavik and Pearl. It's been great to hear about your work in schools. We all operate here in the United Kingdom, though, in a national context, which can be quite challenging. Drama and dance aren't foundation subjects in the national curriculum. We have a qualification called the EBAC, or the English Baccalaureate. It's made up of seven different GCSE examination subjects. In England, students take GCSE subjects at the age of 16 as they leave secondary school. And the EBAC requires them to have GCSEs in seven different subjects. English language, English literature, maths, two sciences, geography or history, and a language. But there are no art subjects within the EBAC. And that is a major barrier to timetabling the arts in schools particularly in secondary schools. The government's ambition is to see 90% of pupils studying the EBAC subject com combination by 2025. We've had a Conservative government in the United Kingdom since 2010. In 2014, Nicky Morgan, then Education Secretary, warned young people that choosing to study art subjects at schools could limit their career choices and hold them back in the rest of their lives. That's a political context which was very damaging for the arts in schools. Not surprisingly, GCSE entries in many creative subjects have declined in the last 14 years. Since 2010, music GCSE is down 35%, drama is down 40%, media film and TV studies down 49%, and performing and expressive arts are down 69%. A seminal report entitled The Arts in Schools was published. It prompted national debate within the arts and education sectors about the importance of arts teaching and learning, about how the arts were taught and assessed, and the role of cultural organisations. It made 10 different recommendations, three of which are particularly pertinent to this discussion. The first, is that there should be a national conversation in England about the purpose of education, which will form a new view of what is taught in schools and why. The second was that every child should have an entitlement to a minimum of four hours of expressive arts education per week, up to the age of 14. And the third is that the support for the arts in schools should continue to come from the professional arts sector. One of the positive developments in arts education in the last 40 years has been the extent to which cultural organisations, large and small, have engaged with schools. Virtually all arts organisations now have learning teams, have education officers, who engage their organisation with schools across the United Kingdom. And this has transformed the way in which many children and young people and teachers can engage with the arts. It's a real success story in terms of the creative industries in the United Kingdom. So Birmingham Arts School, what do we do? We're part of Birmingham Education Partnership and we seek to ensure that all of Birmingham's 400 schools can engage with the 35 cultural organisations across the city. We've produced cultural landscapes, a digital interactive map which shows us 400 yellow dots for the 400 schools in the city and 35 blue dots for the 35 cultural organisations in the city. When you click on a yellow dot, it tells you the name of the school and the cultural organisations they're partnered with. And when you click on the blue dot, it tells you the name of the cultural organisation, the arts organisation and the schools that they work with. And this map is a really useful tool, in particular for arts organisations, to identify schools that are being underserved across the city when they are seeking new school partnerships. In the last 18 months since I've been in post, I've met around 200 of the 400 head teachers across the city. And when I've asked them about what the barriers are to engaging with arts organisations, 
they, they give me the six C's. Cost, it's often too expensive. Curriculum, it often doesn't fit into their school curriculum or national curriculum. Capacity, they often don't have the capacity to develop a new partnership with an arts organisation. And the arts organisation doesn't always have the capacity to develop a new partnership with a school. Communication has been disjointed and has been hard to navigate. Coaches, by which I mean transport, can be expensive if we're looking at private coach hire and sometimes inaccessible if we're looking at public transport and careers. That there's not always a connection between the arts education offer of cultural organisations and the careers that many children and young people will aspire to when they leave school. So it's been our job at Birmingham Arts School to address these barriers to engagement. In terms of cost, I advise schools on ways in which they can apply for funding, national lottery, charities and trusts, to bring new arts activities to their schools. I also fundraise ourselves so that we can provide opportunities for schools to develop their own festivals, and we are producing the Proud to be a Brummie Festival at Symphony Hall in July of this year. We use the cultural landscape map to identify the 50 least engaged schools in the city. And we invited them to be part of an arts festival. 12 of them are now going to be working with seven different arts organisations. These are schools that haven't had partnerships with arts organisations before. And they're going to be working throughout the spring and summer terms on a variety of different visual and performing arts projects, will be sh which will be showcased at Symphony Hall in the summer as part of the Proud to be a Brummie Festival. This is a wonderful opportunity for schools that haven't previously engaged with arts organisations to benefit from those partnerships which we hope will be sustained. In terms of capacity, we go into schools and we broker partnerships between schools and arts organisations. We encourage head teachers to continue to invest, develop and grow their arts teachers and teams and we encourage artistic directors and CEOs of cultural organisations to continue in what can now be quite a challenging time with the public funding cuts that I've mentioned, to continue to invest and grow their education teams so that they can reach even more schools across the city. In terms of curriculum, we work with arts organisations to help them to align their cultural offer, their arts offer, more closely to the school and national curriculum. We coordinate CPD events for teachers across the city in all different art forms. And we convene teacher networks, the ArtsLink Primary Teacher Network for Arts Primary School teachers and secondary teacher networks in dance, drama and visual art so that those teachers can network, share information and experiences and learn from professional artists about ways in which they can engage more closely with those cultural organisations. We're working with Birmingham Repertory Theatre and Birmingham Royal Ballet to develop new GCSE dance and drama courses. Remember GCSE are the examinations which students do when they leave school at 16, uh, but many schools across the city haven't been able, aren't able to provide GCSE dance within their school timetable. When that's the case, Birmingham Royal Ballet will be offering GCSE dance to students using one of their set dances, Still Life at the Penguin Cafe, as a, as a production to be studied within that GCSE course. And the Birmingham Repertory Theatre will be offering GCSE drama to schools across the city as well that don't currently have that provision. That course will be take place at the theatre and will use one of their productions as one of the set texts to be studied. In terms of communication, we produce arts partnership showcases in which where head teachers have an established partnership with an arts organisation, they invite other head teachers into their school to find out about the work that they're doing and to see in practice the artists and arts organisations working with their students so that other head teachers can be inspired by what they're doing. We have the Hub. The Hub is a one-stop portal on the Birmingham Education Partnership website which provides easy access to the cultural offer provided by arts organisations and artists 
across the city. In terms of careers education, we encourage arts organisations to not just to focus on their art form when they're working with schools, but also to look at the careers that they, that they offer. For every actor, dancer, musician, on stage or screen, there are eight people working behind the scenes. But many young people don't know about those careers. And if they can't see it, they can't be it. So we actively encourage arts organisations to provide more work experience opportunities. We signpost young people towards apprenticeships. And we're looking at some organisations who are looking to employ a pathways manager to take that journey of young people from work experience to apprenticeships through into early career opportunities within their own organisations. Coaches or transport. We've been lobbying Andy Street, the Metro Mayor, who's responsible for transport in the West Midlands region, asking him to provide the same sort of free public tra transport for schools in Birmingham and the West Midlands that schools in London currently enjoy. And we promote ClassPass, the local bus company's scheme, providing cheap daily transport for schools across the city. There are huge opportunities in this city for children and young people to have their arts education enhanced by the rich cultural provision which this amazing city provides. And it's our job to make sure that every child and young person in the city has as much opportunity as possible to engage with the arts and culture. Thank you for listening. Thank you too to Boa Stage and Screen Production, where I was principal a couple of years ago. This is a 16 to 19 vocational skills academy where students are, learn are learning about production skills in film, TV and stage so that they can move into the creative industries. The creative industries in the UK are one of the fastest growing sectors of the economy, worth £116 billion to the UK economy, and there's a significant skill shortage in, the, in that industry. Boa Stage and Screen Production is playing an important part in this city in making sure that the workforce of the creative industries of the future is ready and able to deliver everything it needs to. And most importantly, thank you all for listening. I'm going to be taking questions in a minute or two. Thank you, Dr. Steve. That was amazing to watch. And um, I think what's relevant there is very relevant <laughs> in South Africa as well. And what you've just explained there, it, it's, you know, you guys are doers and you're not just talking about things, you are actively involved in it and you have... Yeah, it sounds like an amazing job. I'm going to hand over now to some questions and answers. I see in the chat box, we don't really have any chat or questions. So people, please feel free to post any questions you've got for Dr. Steve. The chat seems very quiet. Maybe you could just explain a little bit more if there's something that you felt you wanted to explore a little bit more or sort of elaborate on. You're welcome to do that. Um, I, I, I just to reiterate what I was basically saying that we uh, in Birmingham, Birmingham, the second largest city in the UK, we have an, a, 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 an amazing offer for schools across the city, but that offer isn't hasn't been taken up by all schools. And it's, so it's been our job to make sure that as many children as possible across the city can fully engage with the arts and culture, regardless of where they live in the city and regardless of their socioeconomic background. Absolutely. Other questions? I'm conscious the first, when I was uh, watching that, the, the first 20 minutes of the presentation, the, the sound quality wasn't great. I don't know whether that's affected uh, other delegates' ability to listen to the presentation. Yes, they, they did mention that, that. I think it was when you were in, with the panel, talking to the panel, they were yeah. quite soft, they couldn't hear that. So I don't know if, if, it, will be, if it will be helpful to share that video. Um, or what, what suggestion was there? Sorry, why I don't get the Q and A? Can you just? 
I think there are some questions. Um, Dr. Steve, can you see the questions on your screen? Um, I can't actually know. Could you tell me what they are? Yes, I've actually found them here. They say, what would you suggest for fundraising? I think in terms of fundraising, we, we as a Birmingham Art School fundraise ge generically for, for large scale projects, but we also um, engage, we also advise schools on how they themselves can fundraise. Um, that fundraising from schools is normally um, public bodies like Arts Council England, um, but also there are a large number of charities and trusts in the UK that support arts education in schools. So depending on what the project is that the school wants to do, we can signpost um, those schools to those charities and trusts. Okay, and then there's we also, sorry. We also encourage, there is a scheme in, in, in the UK called Pupil Premium, where disadvantaged pupils get around an additional 2000 pounds per pupil to provide them with uh, additional opportunities. Um, and we, so we encourage schools to use that pupil premium funding to, on arts and cultural activities for those children. Good. And then the next one, are the professionals open to this interaction? Ab absolutely. Um, our, all arts organisations in England um, who are funded by Arts Council England, part of that funding there's an expectation that they will engage schools in the cultural activity that those organizations develop. So uh, art, individual artists, small scale arts organizations and large scale arts organizations, by and large, they're all absolutely committed uh, to working with schools and using their arts organizations as really important education resources. And that's not something that's just confined to the education teams or the education officers but it's something which artistic directors and CEOs of these arts organizations are saying quite loud and clear. And the next one, does taking part in competitions will help the school community in South Africa to contribute in the educational development of the arts? Yeah, I think, I think competitions, whether they're talent shows, whether they're award schemes, can absolutely help to raise the profile of arts education in schools and, get, and provide a real focus for arts activity amongst children, young people and teachers. Good, and then there's another one. This is fantastic and I think very vital as this is an international project. How and what can you advise us on getting this rolled out in our schools? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry, um, they're just saying that it is fantastic and they think it's a very vital. So, but this is an international project and they're sort of asking how and what can you advise us here in South Africa to get it rolled out in our schools? I think the, I, I don't know whether there's a network of arts organizations in South Africa that work with children and young people, but I, I'd advise schools to make clear connections with those arts organizations uh, if there isn't already a network to encourage them to form an arts education alliance so that so that those arts organizations in South Africa can continue to develop relationships with your schools in South Africa. It's about part, I think it's principally around partnership and identifying key people in those arts organizations who are keen to work with your schools. Thank you, right. I think that has been your message as well as communities using using what you've got, the resources and the expertise you've got in your in your area. Definitely. Um, let's just have a look. Are there any more questions coming up? And um, here's another question. Do you think the enrichment that the professionals bring raise the level of education and how can this be added to the curriculum? We know that there's been a number of studies, um, international studies that have proved that engagement with the arts in schools improves children's attainment across all subjects of the curriculum. 
it makes them enjoy school more, it makes them more likely to be active citizens when they leave school. So I think it's really important that those of us that work in arts education draw upon, draw upon um, that, that, that evidence is. and use it to promote the important work which teachers and arts organisations are doing with schools. Absolutely, yes. Then there's one more. Can we collaborate with you? They're asking. We'd love to collaborate with you. Uh, my contact details were at the end of that uh, at the end of that presentation. Um, uh, Steve Ball at BEP Education is my email address. I'd love to um, hear from any of you and develop partnerships. Where uh, Birmingham has a number of tw twin cities across the across the world, including Johannesburg, um, but we are really keen to engage in international dialogue and potential online or in-person exchange. So yes, please make contact with me. Fantastic. And just to remind the people that remember they can go on agenda and under the speakers that, that your details, your email address, they actually, it is there on the app so they can connect with you via that. Absolutely, contact me through, through this app and I will get back to you. It would be really good to maintain this international conversation. Great. Let's see, are there any more questions? We've still got time. About four minutes, I think, left for questions. It's not showing on my... I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in here because I'm sitting in the room, Steve, and I just can't resist the opportunity to say hello. <laughs> Hello, lovely to see you. Yes, lovely to see you too, Steve. And thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, it's really exciting to see what you've been doing in, in Birmingham. Um, and, you know, one of the things that Asatej has been doing in South Africa is something a little similar, although I don't think we've managed to be quite as successful as you have. But we've, had, we've got a program called Theatre for Youth. And Theatre for Youth uh, is, in fact, also a website where you can find arts organizations and theater companies that are offering productions for children and young people um, and for schools. And you can also on the back end, find the schools that are interested in receiving this work. And so it's very much a similar kind of a tool looking at how we can bring the schools and the arts organizations into a conversation. Um, but it seems to me that what you've been really strategic about doing is bringing in other partnerships. So for example, looking at those fundraising models, looking at ways to support the transport, which for us in South Africa is also such a huge issue. It's often very difficult to move children around to get them into you know, art galleries, theaters, museums, festivals. Um, and so I'm wondering whether we, you know, what we need to be doing is, is looking for those bigger partnership opportunities. Um, and I also really valued your approach in terms of targeting the least involved schools in terms of your activities. I think there is often a focus on the schools that are already engaged because they're much easier to engage with, you know, um, but uh, that was a real challenge for me that, that that was where you were focusing is choosing the least engaged schools and bringing them into an activity like your your uh, your festival. I'm just wondering, how did you go about convincing those principals, those head teachers, to be involved in something like that if they were not so involved in the arts before? I think what we've done in, in the Plan to Be a Brummy Festival, where we've targeted the least engaged schools in the city, uh, there's been no, we've subsidised that festival so the school isn't having to pay for the artistic activity in those schools, which will culminate in their pupils performing at the festival. All they'll have to do is to get their students either on public transport or private hired coaches to, to Symphony Hall where the festival will take place. So we've incentivised um, mm -hmm. that engagement and then next year's Proud to be a Brummy Festival will work with a different 12 schools who have previously been less engaged as well. So I think there's a, it's about identifying funding for them, identifying the opportunity that's free to the school initially so that they fully appreciate and understand its value. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. I'm not sure whether there are any other questions in the, <laughs> in the Q&A here. I'm just trying to see if there was something that was missed. 
Um, did you did you did you ask the question about recyclable materials? I didn't see that. Okay, so there's a question here about using recyclable materials being such a huge part of what we have to do in South African schools, largely because of the cost uh, implications. And the question is, it seems that European schools do get better funding. Um, does that dampen creativity? Is the question? It's an interesting one. I don't. I don't think it does. I think. Um... To, to quote the late Noel Gregg, the playwright, limitation is stimulation. And I think for us to be able to um, have a particular focus on the resources which we're using, particularly maybe in, a visu in visual arts activities using recyclable materials, but also the way in which arts organizations and theaters uh, subscribe to something called the Green Book, which is a, a code of practice in the UK for ways in which uh, theaters and arts organizations and arts producers will absolutely use recyclable materials for their sets um, and the, where possible we we look at reducing transport costs etc mm, that's that's amazing the, the last question that i'm seeing here is someone saying could we do a teacher exchange i'd like to come and see what you do in person but that's a fantastic idea <laughs> would you You'd be, be very welcome <laughs> we'd love to welcome teachers to birmingham uh, I know Yvette that you know Birmingham from the On yeah. the Edge Artistic Gathering back yeah. in 2016. Uh, we'd look, an exchange would be wonderful, um, but you're all very warmly welcome to come and visit Birmingham and see the whole wide range of arts activities happening in schools here. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand back to your real host. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, Yvette. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Dr. Steve. I think we're at the end of our Q&A and I really appreciate your input and your session today. Thank you. And just to everyone else that, you know, this is the end of our breakout session and we are back in 10 minutes, then we have got Imelda Brand on this breakout lesson. Thank you. <laughs>